what I'm going to describe in a second is not a sin, but it does reflect kind of a cultural issue that kind of will help me make my point today. In the Midwest, I think a lot of you know that I'm from Michigan originally, so there it's considered at best childish. At worst, some people would even say it's like really bad and kind of malicious and wrong. I wouldn't go that far, but at the, at the best, it's childish for someone to put ketchup on a hot dog. It's considered child, it's something little kids do, but if somebody's grown up, you're going to have hot dogs, but you know, ketchup is not for adults. You know, maybe for french fries, but you don't put it on a hot dog if you're there. It's a cultural thing, it's not wrong. Um, it's bad taste, according to Midwest people. I'm sorry if you like ketchup on hot dogs. My point is this. The idea is that your taste can kind of is sort of reflective of your maturity as a person. And if you eat the way that a little kid eats and you sort of just continue in the same way and to enjoy the same thing that a little kid does, it shows that there's something in you that hasn't quite developed and grown yet. Um, certainly you can go a little bit farther and say, if what you spend your time on now as an adult, if you're an adult, is the same thing that you spent your time on as a kid, and I'll, I'll give one example. If you still spend hours and hours and hours a day as an adult playing video games the way you did as a kid, yeah, there's something off there. It shows that there's a maturity that hasn't occurred in you yet. Again, none of this, I'm not going to say that there's like some line that, you know, once you turn 14, you're, it's, it's a sin to put ketchup on a hot dog or something like that. It's not. <coughs> but the, the image that Christ used to describe, uses to describe his disciples, he does, right after I, I, I stopped reading, he says, you are the light of the world. Enlightenment is one of the things that Jesus uses to describe what it is to be his disciples. You are not just enlightened, but you're the light of the world. And so you can kind of read that backwards. That means the world is in darkness. The world is in ignorance. The world doesn't understand. And that's right. And part of what it is for, that Christ came into the world is that he brought the world a new understanding of who God is by coming into the world himself. That's fine. But the first image he uses is not that of light. The first is that of salt. You are the salt of the earth. And so the first issue, the primary issue, is not ignorance. That's not the main problem. The problem is not that the world doesn't understand God. It's that the world doesn't like God. It's not that the world is ignorant. It's that the world has bad taste. And here, with spiritual things, it's serious. It's not like taste in food. Something much heavier. It's not the world. And so if we are to be the disciples of Christ, it's not just that we are to understand the right way. It's not just about this intellectual thing. And you can, you can see why, because that would be kind of weird. Christ loves and he, he gives his heart to all human beings. And there was no point where it seemed that he made, had a preference for, for people that were super intelligent or educated. He seemed to prefer people that were very poor most of the time, which means they would have been very uneducated. So if it was just about intellectual stuff and learning, that doesn't seem to quite synchronize with, with what Christ is about. Yes, that's a big part of it, but it's not just about learning. It's about transforming what we like. It's about changing our taste. And that's why I think salt is the, is the primary images, the image he uses here. So if we can look into ourselves, it's not just that the world has bad taste. We do too, because the world is still part of us. What does it mean to have bad taste? Well, it means that we enjoy things that are bad for us. That we like to do things, that we take pleasure in things that are harmful. 
Now that's where the parallel works really well because I don't think ketchup is very good for you. It's salt and sugar, and maybe a little bit of tomato, but I doubt it. It's not a thing, something that, and so to have the kind of taste in spiritual things or in life activities, to enjoy things that are actually really bad for us, to enjoy maybe friendships that are really bad for us, or to care more about things that are really pointless than we do about things that are meaningful and, and good. Or, on the, on the other side, the flip side of this, to dislike things that are really good for us. And I think that's something that maybe everybody can relate to. We enjoy sinful things. Well, sin by definition is the thing that's going to harm us. But it's not just that. We enjoy stuff that hurts us, but the stuff that actually helps. The easiest example to give is prayer. Sometimes it's really hard to pray. And sometimes we don't have a taste for it. And we don't find any enjoyment in doing either any good activity with another person, but, or, or even sort of conversing with God in our hearts. That's exactly the problem. And so don't think that, well, I don't like doing it, so I'm not going to do it. No, that's, that's backwards. You are the problem. You have to change. If salt loses its flavor, it's worthless. And that's the last thing Christ wants for us. He wants us to have taste. And if we don't, if we don't like something that should be liked, that we should like, we're the problem, not the thing. And if we like things that are harmful for us, Again, we are the problem. We are the thing that has to change. It is our taste that has to grow up, that has to mature. And the, the, the analogy of salt is really, really helpful. I think Christ is, is, is hitting the nail on the head, as he always does. Because the way our tastes change is not just by force. We can change some of our habits by force. You know, let's say you need to wake up in the morning and you're not in the habit of waking up in the morning. You can do it. You set an alarm or you have somebody pour water on you or something like that. And that'll get you up in the morning. And it might be, will get you up in the morning every day if, if they keep doing that, if, if you keep doing that. But it's not going to turn you into a morning person. You can enjoy, you can force your kids or yourself to eat something that's healthy. Right? And I, you probably should at some point. But that's not going to develop their palate. It's going to start. It's a, first, it's a step in the right direction. You should definitely do that. But what's actually going to change their taste is by allowing them or yourself not just to do this, but to relish it. The word relish is really interesting. You know what relish means? Relish is the thing that we put on hot dogs. Right? But it's also a verb. And the verb relish means to just sort of savor and enjoy something. To taste and just let yourself taste something that you hadn't tasted before. And maybe you didn't like relish a year ago, or you didn't like mustard a year ago, or you didn't like, I don't know, steak a year ago. You didn't like broccoli a year ago. But you know, try it again. And try to sort of see what is it that people like about this. And maybe you've become a different person. And maybe that sort of moment of enjoyment will let your taste grow up just a little bit. And maybe prayer has to be that way as well. You do have to force yourself to pray sometimes. Believe me. And maybe you have to force yourself to pray every day. But that can't be the end of it. Let yourself sort of taste it. And it's not about, I feel this presence of God. It's not about that. It's not this intense feeling. In fact, that's exactly the problem with ketchup. The reason why it's considered childish is because it's a very intense flavor. What is it to have a mature taste? What is it to enjoy the flavor of a good steak? It's that it's not that intense. It's that it's kind of subtle. It's quiet to enjoy really refined music instead of really loud music or really intense music. It's because it's less intense. And to enjoy prayer means to let yourself just sort of sit in stillness in just a kind of quiet, motionless moment and to just feel that. And you know what it feels like? It feels like nothing. It just feels like silence. That's a good feeling. Because everything around us is always moving, is always bright colored, is always flashing in our eyes. 
and to enjoy the silence of prayer, to let yourself relish that, I think that's what it means to sort of transform into being a disciple of Christ. And even if you can sort of do that just for a couple of seconds, do it for a couple of seconds. Just sort of take that moment and just say, God is present with me. I'm just going to just enjoy this silence. And that's not just developing a habit of making yourself pray every day. That's actually helping your mind and your heart to mature, your taste to mature. And then you'll see how things develop. You'll see how you kind of grow up in your heart. And then when you go back to the stuff that you used to enjoy, after a while, you're going to realize you're a different person. And it's not going to be, oh, I'm so tempted to do this and I have to draw, like, pull myself away from this temptation. No, at some point you're going to grow up and you're going to say, that's really lousy. How did I ever like that? How did I ever like, I don't know, looking at dirty things on, on the internet? That's an ugly, it's not just going to be this thing that you, you force yourself to, to look at. How, how did I ever like you know, looking at somebody as an object? How did I ever think that just making millions and millions of dollars is the greatest thing in the world, and that's all there is to life. You're going to realize that you used to have, be somebody with bad taste. And you're going to wonder how you ever enjoyed those things. Because you've tasted so much, something so much better. And prayer is one part of this, and the liturgy is another big part of this. And it's one of the reasons why it doesn't sort of, you can't just jump right into it. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, and good parents realize this, that, you know, they're not going to like healthy food at first. So you have to put something in it that tastes a little bit better. And maybe silence isn't the thing that we can immediately enjoy. And so the liturgy, when you come to church, we sing. And we're praying, but we're, there's something, there's a sweetness to it. It's like adding a little bit of, you know, the, adding sugar to medicine. That's the old saying, right? And that's what the church tries to do in this liturgy. We try to have the church be a beautiful building. It's very pacha when people say, oh, a church should be a very small, simple building. Why? That's, it's for us. It's not that God is going to get something out of it. We are human beings with bodies and eyes, and we like color. Why shouldn't worshiping God be something beautiful? And it's weird that the people that sometimes say that have much bigger and fancier houses than the church that they're describing. No. The church should be a very beautiful place, and the music should be extremely beautiful. And everything about it should be something that's, that draws us in so that we can develop a taste for things that are more and more and more godly. And when we do that, not just, it's not just that our taste will change, we will become the salt of the earth that Christ is describing, and we'll be able to transform not just the mind, but the heart of the world and the people around us as well.